Good evening and welcome back to the developer multiplayer session of Europa Universalis 4 with the new Cossacks DLC. Now we'll get our disclaimers out of the way beforehand. The, uh, the Cossacks DLC will be released to you in a week's time, but until then we are still streaming it both for uh, our internal testing and for your entertainment, you and our entertainment. With that in mind, your mileage may vary when this gets released, but uh, nonetheless, here we are. Our fine players here, ready to make history. So, uh, we're just waiting for everybody to join in and get readied up. Looks like we'll be starting on the dot at 3 o'clock. And we'll watch the carnage unfold. Now this is developer multiplayer where friends become frenemies and your co-workers become co-belligerents. And if you tuned in last time, you'll be familiar with the... Um, we had a Treaty of Vienna, which uh, was pretty much a treaty of friendship. All with the combined goal of making a few territorial exchanges between larger, uh, larger nations. But most importantly, protecting the sovereign independence of Gotland. And that all went off without too much of a hitch. There were some questions about the Danish uh, stranglehold over Gotland. But all the hostilities of that seem to have melted away as Gotland are uh, well and truly independent. Of course, that only took effect for the previous session and... Uh, all deals are off in that regard, except for the fact that Gotland must remain independent. Otherwise, the carnage is free to commence. Now, I'm not saying I've been trying to stir things up, but, uh, well, we'll see how things go for the heavy hitters in Europe in this session. Now, I've got my eyes over there on the chat. If you have any questions about this, about the Cossacks DLC or the campaign we have there, just tag us at uh, Paradox Interactive. And I'll be keeping my eyes there as I watch the carnage unfold here in the world. So we'll give a quick rundown of what is going on with the players we have. We have Wiz over in Great Britain now. He's wanting to prove that uh, despite some weak Britons we've seen in the past, they can be played effectively, and he's doing well in that regard. This is a fairly well-established Britain, with holdings in Norway, quite the chunk of France, and all of the British Isles. So if we go and check out what they've been doing, they've also been checking out in the new random new world. And again, if you have um, if you've not been keeping up to date, we have uh, gone and taken out back and shot the old random new world, and from its ashes built this, the new random new world based on a tile system, and we think it's pretty good. And I bet Great Britain is thinking it's pretty good, since they're out there capitalizing all of it. So uh, we don't know everything about it. We thought we'd seen it all when we saw the, uh, the continent to the south. But it seems that Great Britain are wanting to get their clutches on the new island they've found, quite far to the northwest there. Great Britain took advantage of some uh, French and Burgundian weakness early on and secured the west coast of France for themselves, whilst good old Patrick struggles in France to uh, maintain their identity, trying to wriggle their way down through Italian lands simply to stay alive. We also have Spain and Portugal, which for the most part have been peaceful. They have been allied up with Great Britain since the very start. And whilst Spain goes for the vast riches of the southern continent, Portugal are going for uh, the more orthodox route of finding their way around Africa. They're doing not too shabby with that. Who else do we have now? Uh, we have Obi Dobi, who's feeling a little sandwiched there in Italy. Now, they, they had this goal. Dude, I just want to form Italy, I believe he said to me. Oh, Obi Dobi, things aren't looking too hot for you. But who knows, they might secure some good alliances and pull through. Then again, Austria, who made the boast that they want a big, strong Austrian empire, have really been putting the stranglehold on them, taking all this very, uh, very well-developed central Italian land. So our big Austria player could prove to be quite the threat and end up sticking the, uh, the killing knife into Milan. 
We have Bohemia, who was having a bit of a rebel problem last time. They seem to have powered their way through that and more or less religiously united their land. Fairly strong reformation we've had as well. Protestantism uh, really entrenching itself over in Britain and Hungary, whilst reform really spreads out through those Czech lands. Uh, some people are asking about the Ottomans. Indeed, it's Mr. Nibbles who's now in charge instead of the Witch King. Uh, Mr. Nibbles, quite the veteran player, and he's been scraping off his rust. We'll see how he fares here. Now, because it was a change of player, who knows what happens to all the uh, diplomacy there. The Ottomans used to align themselves very tightly with the powers of Austria, Hungary, and Bohemia, but have chosen to just uh, throw off those shackles and instead embrace the warm, loving clutches of the Mughals. The Mughals here formed by Timurids, giving up their horde ways and their ability to raise provinces to the ground in exchange for, uh, well, really setting their eyes on India. Oh my. Bachmanes had better prepare, because this would be one clash of the titans. Let's see, between them they are on par technologically, and they both have so-so in charge. But the Mughals have also got a Russian alliance. Now, who's to say if that is merely defensive, or if those two are choosing to bro up to the end of times? But I don't think Bachmanes is that strongly established with alliances. Uh, well, we'll see who comes out on top there, but the Mughals now have claims well, ever since they formed Mughals, all over India, and that could spell trouble for Bachmanes, because these are permanent claims. Permanent claims are uh, something new that we have introduced, because, let's be honest, if you form the likes of Mughals or Qing, and you get uh, claims over, say, all of China and all of India, it's a bit of a stretch to try and conquer those inside 25 years. So we've added these permanent ones, they can only be revoked through war. So if uh, Bachmanes really want to secure their, uh, their life against the Mughals, and it comes to war, they may want to consider taking that option to have the Mughals revoke all those claims that they have on them. Now we also have Forza, aka Karsten, down in the Mamluks. Now they... Mamluks have a pretty hard time with the Ottomans in many a campaign, but this time they've been able to draw out uh, some relative peace, Syria being something of a demilitarized zone between the nations. Uh, but because of that, Mamluks have been able to expand, and expand they certainly have. Now, it may look bigger than any Mamluks you've seen before. We have uh, enabled this option where if you have uh, most of the land surrounding a wasteland. The wasteland will adopt your color. There is no gameplay purpose to that, but it always was a bit disappointing when you took all of uh, all of Africa only to see your name form a little smiley face or a frown just right here in the armpit of the, con uh, the continent. So now you can, if you decide to unite the whole continent, see your name stretch from tip to tip. The same goes, a good example here is the Yarkandi wastelands, all colored in in that titanium white. We kind of brushed over a few countries there. We have Burgundy, played by one of the most militaristic nation, um, players we have. But doing oddly peaceful. They have not been expanding too much, and they have been keeping a firm alliance with France. They've no doubt received quite a lot of offers to stab France right in the back. But uh, diplomacy runs deep here in Paradox headquarters. And you have to make some uh, pretty good offers if you want to get somebody to stab someone else in the back. Then again, even though it may be strictly good for Burgundy, they may have other goals in mind. Could be that they really have it in for Great Britain and do not want to weaken their own position by attacking France, their, uh, their core ally. Not even allied with Austria, despite the marriage. Austria playing it incredibly safe, though, gathering allies here, there, and everywhere, despite their own immense amount of power. Let's actually put a number to that power, shall we? Here we are in Austria. 
Income almost hitting 60 ducats a month. Sky high force limit in the triple digits, not to mention uncontested emperor. So yes, Austria already fairly strong, and in our previous sessions, Austria has been something of the guarantor of peace, choosing to simply side with whoever would be the defender in a large war that might erupt over in France, all the while maintaining their very strong alliances over there. Now we do have a question if we have any indications of Korean colonization. Now we can have a look over there. Mandy back in the saddle of Korea, but do we have any colonization going on? Seems they've gone for diplomatic and economic ideas, so they're not reaching out to the new world. But we know that Great Britain is establishing colonies over here, so it may be, if they were to go for it, they would only be attracting the wrath of Wiz. Who I would imagine would want to very, uh, very aggressively keep his stranglehold over the new world. It's looking rather depopulated for players over in Asia, but uh, there haven't been too many eliminated. Normally they would get reseated over here. Speaking of reseating themselves, I didn't realize that Portugal had made all their way over here, trying to grab up that spice. Now, since Portugal's firmly allied with Castile, their only natural enemy, they are free to do this as much as they want, and as long as relations uh, remain good between them, then there should be no big issues there. Trying to keep an eye on who is at war, but it just seems that we have minor wars at the moment. But all that could change when people start reaching out for their victory cards. And again, we'll explain those if you haven't uh, seen them before. We'll take Bachmanes as our example. Now, they got their first victory card. Uh, well, it would have spawned in 1450 if they had 3 under development, but I think they had to get to that point first. And they first got their victory card on these four provinces, and as long as they control those, they will get the bonus. Ticks up and down in about 20 years, but it gives them 1,000 points. And we play for points here in the office. Points make prizes. You want the, uh, you want the big-ass trophy at the end of it all. But you need to come out in first, second, or third to grab one of them. So Bachmanes are in first place with 18, 14 points there. But if they want to grab a further 2,000 points, which is what their second victory card would be worth, they're going to have to dig into the Mughals. So they're going to need to keep that in mind. Now you can only have at most two victory cards at one point. So let's take a sorry example, Hungary. Hungary being played by Fido, ever the turtle player. Now, they're not one to really strike out on aggression on their own, but they are very happy to sit and consolidate their power, even if it means having some grotesquely ugly borders. Previously, everybody was given the ugly borders casus belli on Hungary. Sadly, they made nothing of it, but Hungary might yet repair these awful borders. But I digress. Hungary... Their sorry situation is that they have two victory cards on their closest ally, Austria. And uh, though they may claim to keep a gentleman's agreement, Hungary knows deep down that they're going to have to secure one of these victory cards if they want a chance to get a second, uh, sorry, a third and a fourth victory card. Now the first two are only worth 1,000 and 2,000. Next two are worth three and four thousand. Those really tip the scales when it comes to the score. And remember, that is what we're playing for here. It's also a good time for one of my other disclaimers that uh, this uh, this building is still something of a building site. And there may be drilling and hammering in the background. I'm certainly hearing it. I don't know if you are, but uh, sadly nothing we can do about that at this point in time. So, there'll be a gentleman's agreement between Hungary and Austria, if uh, what I'm told is to be believed, but for how long can such a thing last? And there's the thing about uh, knowing your players. Hungary is manned by Fido here, and they are not an aggressive player. It would be very unlike them to strike out. They would need somebody else to uh, come in and offer the opportunity. So uh, Austria will have to keep in mind that Hungary will be listening out for any such offers. If Burgundy and Bohemia were both to approach Hungary and go, 
Listen, we really think Austria should be carved up, and those victory cards rightfully belong to you. Then Hungary could well be persuaded. To add to that, Hungary are really going to want to seek out their Western focus. Now, uh, a free Westernization is always a tantalizing prospect, but they would have to own and core either Prague or Rien, and uh, they're going to prefer that Austrian land, since it's their victory card as well. Then again, there is the ever-present threat of Russia. Grugi was swiftly eliminated from Lithuania, and they simply hopped across the border into Russia, where they are, even though they are orthodox, doing all kinds of unorthodox things, like keeping Novgorod as a vassal. Never would have thought that in all my days, but they've decided to go for it. Not even integrating them just yet. Poor Novgorod. I do really like them, even though they are quite a large country. Okay, good to know you guys aren't hearing the construction, but uh, rest assured I am and the rest of the office is. Uh, now, we're being asked, were there any pre-gameplay treaties this week? It was quite a treat last week when uh, our devs actually came down and physically signed the treaty, the Treaty of Vienna to, uh, well, we can go through it actually. It was to uh, give over the province of Tarragona to Spain. It had been seized by France in a land grab against Aragon before Aragon could get eliminated. But the offset for France in that case was that they managed to get all of Sardinia for themselves. There was also to be no engagement of warfare between these nations and their close allies, and perhaps most importantly, Gotland's independence would be secured. Good old Gotland. They need to fulfill all their Guntish ideas for me to be satisfied, and of course live on forever. Now, it seems that Spain, since they've established themselves in the large continent to the south, have done us the favor and revealed all of the random new world for us. Well, almost all of the random new world. But the likelihood of there being some land up there is slim at best. So we have quite a few islands still around here. Their worth is questionable, but we can actually put... Uh, put some info into that by hitting the development map mode. Now a lot of it looks to be fairly virgin land, with the exception of our frozen lands to the south. Very frozen indeed, but we've got some fairly high development levels around here. And a natural harbour. If we get our Antarctic base up and running down here, could be some good money in it. And this is where the random new world ends, and uh, the boring old world begins. So thank you, Spain. You've now revealed it all for us. But just how much is it that you are going to seize? What will your destiny be? They're certainly looking to paint all of this continent in their uh, sickly yellow. Perhaps there's been an agreement between Great Britain and Spain. I take the north, you take the south, Portugal goes around for the spices. Now this will really uh, power up all these nations. France and Burgundy know this, now they are not getting themselves out over there in the New World. In fact, they have very little to expand to. I got Mamluks sealing off uh, Africa for them. And Portugal appears to have protector, uh, made protectorates here. I can double check that. Yep, sure enough, Jolof and Cabu have been made into protectors for Portugal, so they've uh, even sealed off this area. And if France and Burgundy were to take exploration... Oh, and France has. This will be uh, ringing alarm bells for Great Britain, as if to say uh, these nations are going to be competing in the New World with you. Now we're being asked to check out the colonial regions. Also gives us an opportunity to <clears throat> show off our map modes here, when we showed them off before. But uh, now you can have uh, 10 of the quick map mode buttons hotkeyed to you, and if you want more, they're under these tabs right here. Now what we will be looking for are the colonial regions, there we go. Now excuse me as I butcher these names, but we have Colonial Varanga, 
of Varanja up there. We've got Colonial Omamig. Dynamically generated names around here. And, uh, ah, Lukatun. Wonder if Lucky Luca could establish themselves there. And, uh, Cap Keep. Very large uh, colonial region up there, but we also have Colonial Rehuanok. Of course, it's up to the nations what they decide to call their own colonies. We have uh, Lancastria, Maryland, uh, oh, but uh, Spanish Apple knows. I mean, that that's actually kind of, uh, kind of funny to me. Spanish Nahaito, but that's not yet a colonial nation, that is simply a regionalized naming for their enclave there. Which is why we see British France here, that's not an independent nation under Britain. It is simply a localized area, since it is British land, and it is over in the region of France. In 1444 you would see uh, English Normandy and English Gascony, since those are based on the smaller regions. No real uh, gameplay change to having them named like that, but it's it's something that we kind of missed. There was a similar thing in uh, Europa Universalis 3, but it, it didn't always quite work out when you would see French Castile in North Africa, since it was based on cores and ownership. I like to think we've got uh, a better system these days. Poor Sweden that used to be manned by Troy Goodfellow, well, he's not doing them any good anymore. He's well and truly abandoned ship, and the letter Z is getting their clutches all up in there. Seems to be a joint attack going on there, but no, I do not think Sweden is long for this world. Being asked to show religions off. Yeah, I've got my eyes in the chat for you. And here we go, fairly successful Protestant Reformation. I was not aware that uh, Italy had gone reformed as well. And we can also check out what bonuses they're deciding to indulge themselves in. I suspect mostly military ones, but we can check that out. Indeed, the Church of Hungary is going for holy sacraments and saints accept prayers. Nice little buff to your discipline and your morale and uh, going for the missionary strength while you still have places to convert. would imagine they're going to switch that out later on, once they have uh, religiously unified their land, but this is helpful for them, because it means they do not have to grab religious ideas in order to convert all this uh, heretical land. Now, I would hazard a guess that Great Britain is going for the more colonial-geared church. Yep, yeah, the Church of Great Britain. Again, going for the uh, military, because you never know when your uh, best of friends in the multiplayer are going to turn on you. Oh dear, I, I see something very disheartening here. Let's tear our eyes away from Great Britain for a moment to look at poor Milan. Oh dearie me. It seems that Italian ambition is uh, rushing through the veins of Austria here. They're at war with Austria in the Milanese-Austrian War. Oh, in fact, Milan is the one that attacked Austria. No doubt they're being goaded into that, since uh, poor Milan knew that their fate was being decided by those around them. Even Bohemia has called into this war. But no, Milan's time on this earth can really be summed up by this battle. Out of men, out of land, and out of luck. It's almost too painful to see. Now this is some extremely high development land. Yeah, the uh, development around these parts really rather high, especially the capital, Milan, right there, staggering 34. 
And this is going to really strengthen Austria, but people have got to uh, keep that in mind. Now, they might not get all the aggressive expansion from this, they are the defender after all. But people will be knowing that Austria is an up-and-coming power here, and a dangerous one at that. Tragic times. And so somebody wanting to check out Russia's ideas. Those Muscovite ideas starting off with core creation cost very strong, but they've gone religious and quantity, because the one thing we know about uh, Russia is they can never have too many men. They already get plus 25 and plus 50 manpower from their ideas, adding to that uh, manpower recovery speed of 10%. And you know what they need is another 50% and 20% on the manpower and manpower recovery. So Russia is going to be drowning in men. Uh, that said, their manpower is rather low. Perhaps they've been building up. And the question is, for what would Russia build up? I don't think the Swedes are going to be offering that much resistance. Perhaps they're eyeing up Hungary and just waiting for the moment to strike. And then again, they keep their alliance there. And uh, there's been some tweaks to stop uh, instant backstabbing. If they were to break that alliance, they would be chewing on a truce there. So the ability to uh, very quickly gank your ex-compatriots... Uh, well, it comes with consequences. It comes with consequences indeed. Yeah, we've got other wars going on, but I don't think anything too major. It is more or less just the death of Milan at the moment. So many people at war with Milan, and uh, France is still allied to them. This actually hurts France a little, since it means that uh, they can't just go in and chew up what's left of Milan. Now Milan, although they are rather small in size, because of their development being really high, it would take two very large bites to eat them up, and even then I'm not so sure that would uh, you'd be able to swallow it whole. Then again, there is Burgundy. Burgundy has no such commitments there. No claims either, but uh, it remains to be seen if they will swoop down on this. Now, as I said, Burgundy, a very militaristic player. Manned by Greykulf. You may have seen them in previous uh, multiplayer sessions as well. I've been uh, I've toe-to-toe -to -toe with them on the battlefield. It's not easy. It's not easy by a long shot. We got good old Winter Wolf wanting to know about Russia. Oh my. Nope, just looking in the wrong map mode there. I thought, how did Russia manage to eat Novgorod that quickly? But uh, as for Russia, their victory cards. All the more reason to be chewing up Hungary. They have two victory cards on them. In fact, I think Hungary is the target of a lot of victory cards, and this is a consequence of them blobbing in everybody's face. Let's have a little look at the Ottomans, shall we? What a surprise. Victory card all over Serbia. And that's their uh, more valuable victory card. Now, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> you can have two victory cards that you can uh, go and get. You won't be able to get a third one until you secure one of the other two. So if you were Ottomans in this situation, and you were wanting to get your third victory card, which of these two would you be going for? The one over in Syria, which you'll have to take down the Mamluks and not likely have much help against them. Or the one that's twice as good on Hungary, whilst many, many other players also have uh, incentive, shall we say, to go and target the Hungarian menace. They are a menace on the eyes with their hideous borders. Perhaps the world can come together to crush this uh, threat to beautiful maps. Oh, now this is an interesting move by Austria here. What's going on? They have Manchua as a vassal. Looks like they're going to want to be giving some of that to them. Wouldn't be surprised if uh, priority one for them is to block off their blue and Burgundian uh, friends to the west. Stop them from taking a nibble out of Milan, because Milan is now well and truly dead. Sorry to say it, Obi-Dobi. 
But it's back to the locker room for you. 